Thank you, Jamil. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for bringing this together and inviting me. And since I saw that this goes together with the talk of the newly established SFB Kuko Lima, I want to take the chance and congratulate for this nice success. And I wish you hopefully 12 years of exciting research. So I want to tell you something about our experiments on studying the non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum gases in time-dependent disorder. And let me give you a brief glimpse of why we do this and what we want to learn. So you all know probably that quantum gases can change dramatically their behavior in disordered potentials. And a prime example is Anderson localization, where in non-interacting gases, you can have a localization of single particle wave functions. And this has been experimental re experimentally realized. And uh, also these gases in weak or weakly interacting gases have been studied in disorder. And recently in strongly interacting ladder systems, well, the counterpart in interacting systems, the many body localization has been discovered. What I want to tell you stays in a bulk gas. And what we want to add is we use interacting quantum gases and now look at time dependence of the system. And time dependence can now affect two of these quantities. The first is the time dependence of the quantum gas. So we want to perturb the quantum gas and study on which time scale the gases respond and relax. And likewise, we can control the disorder and associate a time dependence to the disorder. So to say the time scale on which the system loses its memory and changes the disorder configuration to a new configuration. To be more quantitative, the quantum gases have a healing length, a length scale on which they can react to a perturbation and a time scale with that they can react to a perturbation that is the inverse chemical potential. And we want to now perturb the system on a length scale with a disorder that is comparable to the healing length and on a time scale of the disorder change that is comparable or faster than the inverse chemical potential. And the question we want to ask is what dominates the response of a quantum system to or a relaxation after time dependent disorders? What do I mean by dominating? If you look into literature, there are many examples of non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum fluids. For example, here is an example of uh, superfluid helium flowing around such an obstacle. We see large scale turbulence emerge that decays after some time. Or there have been mechanisms realized how the system uh, evolve in time in a non-equilibrium matter. And that is, you see here individual vortex lines of vortices in superfluid helium that connect and then interact with each other and separate again. Or recently also in cold gases, shaking of a quantum gas led to the discovery of turbulence and turbulent cascades. In all these uh, cases, the perturbation and also the detection referred the density of the system. But of course, if you have a macroscopic quantum system, there is an amplitude or a density associated with that and a quantum phase that establishes long range coherence. And the question that we want to ask experimentally is, can we unravel the contribution of density and long range phase coherence for the quantum dynamics? And if yes, what limits the relaxation of a non-equilibrium quantum system? And what I want to discuss is I want to show you how we study this experimentally by preparing quantum gases along the BECBCS crossover in control disorder. I want to show you how we experimentally distinguish between density contributions and long, uh, long range phase coherence. And I want to show you in two, well, very short spotlights, how we go towards studying the unitary gas in disorder with dissipation and quantum gases in dynamical disorder. And if, you, if you're afraid that I'm out of time, these last two points will be only two slides. All right, let me show you a little bit the experimenter's tools to realize all this. That is the team that is doing this. And let me point out here Benjamin Nagler, who's been the head of all this. And uh, Jennifer and Zian are the new PhD students. Uh, Silvia was a diploma student and has now um, turned to my boson experiment. What we do in the lab is we prepare lithium gases. Here's a sketch of our vacuum chamber. Lithium six uh, atoms up to 10 to the five, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the six particles in two spin states at temperatures of around 100 nanokelvin. 
And lithium features a broad Feshbach resonance that allows you to tune the interaction strength of the two different spin states to be either repulsive or attractive. And depending on this, you can um, realize a molecular Bose-Einstein condensate that we can prepare quasi-pure, or a BCS-type superfluid, or right on resonance, you can create so-called unitary gases where the interaction is resonant and dominates the rest of all the length or energy scales in the system. That is the quantum gas that we can prepare, and the disorder is a very simple realization. We create an optical speckle potential by taking a green laser beam shining it through a ground glass plate, focusing this by an objective with a fairly high numerical aperture down to the atomic uh, cloud. And this is a picture, CCD camera picture of this speckle pattern. And due to the optical dipole force, this intensity distribution leads to repulsive disorder potential for the atoms. And the characterization of this, just for those who might be interested in this, is first by the mean potential depth, which can be of the order or larger than the chemical potential. A second important quantity is the so-called correlation length, which in our case can be measured and amounts to something like 700 nanometers in the transverse direction and along the propagation direction due to the optical imaging system at a six times larger, so a couple of micrometers. And that is now the speckle potential that we can exert onto the atoms. The Geometry is shown like this. So the red here in the middle, that is an elongated quantum gas that we trap in a combined trap made up of a magnetic saddle potential that you see here in the back in yellow that provides, first of all, the longitudinal confinement of a cloud and an optical dipole trap that provides the radial confinement of a cloud. The speckle potential is um, applied from below and you see the long axis of the speckle potential coincides with a short axis of the cloud, so that there the cloud roughly sees just pillars. And imaging integrates from above and also resolves now the two short axes of the speckle potential. Now the question is, how does a molecular Bose-Einstein condensate respond to disorder quenches or to disorder, first of all? And I want to show you two observables that we can measure to really probe in a very distinct way, the density and the long range phase coherence. So the first is we measure the in situ density distribution. So what is shown here is an absorption image of the cloud without disorder. And you see essentially the Thomas Fermi profile of the trapped gas. When we very adiabatically apply our disorder potential and then in the end take a picture of the cloud, what you see is here this density distribution, where you still see the two dimensional Fermi, uh, Thomas Fermi profile, but in addition, you see fluctuations or corrugations of the density that now reflect the response of the gas in a new equilibrium to the disorder potential. We can quantify this by just subtracting the Thomas Fermi profile. We we re just retain the fluctuations and quantify them by adding them up in a quantity, which I call sigma in the following. And we can measure this as a function of disorder strength. What you see here in blue and in orange are the corrugations of such a quantum gas. If we apply the disorder adiabatically, or if we really quench into disorder and wait until a new equilibrium has established. And you see the difference is not large. So that's the first observable to directly see the density fluctuations as a response of the disorder. The second one is a dynamical one. And what we do there is we switch off our dipole trap and study the expansion of the gas in the saddle potential, in this yellow potential of the magnetic field. And what we see, or in a simulation, what we expect to see if, if we look from above is for a thermal gas, a change of aspect ratio because in the remaining um, trap here, the cloud oscillates and you see the aspect ratio changes a little bit in a periodic manner. If, however, we don't have a thermal gas, but a quantum gas, we really have long range phase coherence and a uniform phase in, this, in the system. Instead of this thermal expansion, we expect to see real hydrodynamic expansion where you see that the aspect ratio changes much more pronounced. And we can also quantify this 
What do you see here is a measure of the aspect ratio of such a cloud as a function of expansion time. In purple, you see this for a thermal cloud above condensation temperature. And in green, you see this for a Bose-Einstein condensate, where indeed the aspect ratio here, well, not diverges, but increases strongly. And this dashed line is the expectation for an ideal gas. And you see this small di um, discrepancy here is due to hydrodynamic, collisional hydrodynamics of the thermal gas. And to show you that this green curve, this strong enhancement of aspect ratio is really due to um, condensation, we have here a comparison of the peak aspect ratio that starts to change and I show this strong enhancement just when a condensate forms and the condensate fraction becomes non-zero. So to conclude, the second observable is the peak aspect ratio in this expansion experiment which we take as a measure of long-range coherence. Now we want to use these two observables to study the response of a quantum gas to a quench of disorder. That means we take this condensate and now apply the disorder on a timescale which is much faster than the inverse chemical potential of the order of a microsecond. If we look at a global variable, and that is the width of the cloud, we see here that the short axis changes. That is, you put in repulsive energy in the system, the cloud starts to expand. The long axis is hardly affected, and the solid lines is a prediction of a numerical model that I'll explain in a second by our colleague um, Giuliano also. And the question we want now to answer is, what is the time scale on which the local density and the phase coherence respond. And that is shown here. So here in blue is the response of the density, of the density corrugations that you see. And you see that starting from low density corrugation, after a certain time scale, you pile up density fluctuations and come to a new equilibrium. And this is associated, obviously, with a certain time scale. On the other hand, the peak aspect ratio drops already from a Hydro coherent hydrodynamics to classical hydrodynamics on a much faster time scale. The dash line that you see here, that is a simulation of, the, of a gross pitevsky simulation by Giuliano also that I want to explain in a second, which predicts here roughly the correct time scales. So what Giuliano has done, and this has taken us almost a year now to complete, is a simulation based on a so-called uh, Craig-Nicholson approach where he had to use a fairly large grid with a fairly small sample size, 160 nanometers, because our, our disorder has such a small correlation length. We use the same speckle statistical properties as in, in, in the experiment. The optical resolution of speckle and imaging is taken into account. And the only drawback, so to say, is that it assumes t equals zero. And I'll show you in a second that that is a little bit of a discrepancy. Uh, one millisecond time evolution requires two hours of computation time on a fairly good supercomputer, and this limits later on the relaxation simulations. But what we are rewarded with are really in situ measurements of the density and here cuts of the phase distribution. And from the, from the phase distribution, what we can infer is the correlation length of the phase. And we see that the correlation length of the phase now decays with applied disorder pulse. And we take here a correlation length in a certain area between 80% and 20% as a measure, so to say, of the long range phase coherence. So now to summarize what we find is shown here. That is the time scale on which the molecular Bose-Einstein condensate responds to the density or with the density and with the long range phase coherence. And what you see is that on all cases on all disorder strengths, the density responds much slower, one order of magnitude slower than the long range phase coherence just decays. The solid lines are very simple energy arguments that I don't go into details now. And the dashed lines here is the prediction by Giuliano's uh, 3D simulation. And uh, this systematically deviates. And the reason that I want to very briefly show is just finer temperature. So here is the simulation of the gross pitevsky equation. And here is a local density approximation. And you see this deviates. So the first conclusion is local density approximation is probably not valid. But if you assume it, then you see that temperature for this measure of the density fluctuations has already a strong 
impact because you look at a local fluctuation. So that explains from our perspective, the response or the deviation of the theory. Now, this is maybe not so surprising, but what is now an interesting question is, how does the system relax from a disordered state? So what we do is we adiabatically ramp the system into a disordered state and wait until it has equilibrated. And then we abruptly remove the disorder and ask the question on which time scale does density distribution and long range phase coherence respond? What we find is that the density fluctuations decay and thereby the overall smooth density. Actually, density. There is a question for the, just the difference between green and blue dashed lines in slide 20. So if you go to slide yes. 20, there is someone that wants to know the difference between green and blue dashed lines. The green is a gross bitevsky simulation with a quench disorder, and the blue is the one with a, where you ramp adiabatically and wait until you have, it's an adiabatic one. Thank you. So you see here that the, on a certain time scale, again, you recover a smooth distribution. Another striking thing that we see is that on a much, much longer time scale, two orders of magnitude longer, you need to re or to revive long range coherence and hydrodynamic uh, expansion. And what you see here is that in numerics, we can simulate this, uh, well, density response. There are some oscillations that come from quadrupole oscillations in the system that are damped in the experiments. So we don't see them experimentally, but unfortunately the numerics is so, um, I so large of an effort that we were not able to really simulate this to a degree where we could predict uh, hydrodynamic expansion. However, what we see as a conclusion is that for all densities or all disorder strengths that we see, um, long range phase coherence needs two orders of magnitude longer to relax compared to the density. And this uh, time scale is longer than any time scales in the problem. So this line is this the time scale a signal needs to cross once with a speed of sound through the condensate. And our interpretation of this is that first, the long range phase coherence dominates here, obviously the um, dynamics. And second, it's limited by long lived phase excitations that might be topologically protected. And that's something we want to look in, into the future. And very briefly, just in a in very few slides, let me show you how we want to go now to the question how unitary gas responds and how it responds to a disorder with dissipation. So unitary gas is easily realized by going here to the uh, center of the resonance. And what we have done, we have repeated these measurements and I just want to show you here preliminary data where the conclusion is that for the quenches into disorder, the time scales are comparable. There is no surprise in a unitary gas. For the quench out of disorder, the surprise a little bit is that the long range coherence is established faster, but this we interpret as a, re, um, as a consequence of the much stronger interactions that make the superfluid just more ideal. But now let's ask the question, what could happen if you now associate this quench with a loss of particles? So if you put in a repulsive disorder potential, if you ramp down a little bit the optical dipole trap, atoms spill out of the system and you perturb the system, not only in density and phase, but also in particle number. And that is shown here with preliminary data also, so that, that is work in progress, where we look at a, a disorder quench and reduce the optical dipole trap power such that in a molecular Bose Einstein condensate or in a unitary gas, only a fraction of particles remain. And the question is, which system will now react faster if, for example, both molecular Bose Einstein condensate and a unitary gas lose half of their particles? And also, because that is preliminary, I want to give you just the statements that we see so far. So the first is the time scales of the density response is not affected by dissipation nor for the quench into nor out of. So the density, and that is our interpretation, it's more like a two particle interaction effect that dominates this. So that is not affected by dissipation. The time scale for the quench into disorder is not affected by dissipation, neither in the BC nor in the unitary regime, also for, for the phase, uh, phase coherence response. So the phase coherence decays in the same way. 
The maybe surprising thing is that the relaxation of long-range